Natalia, you're muted. Okay, then let me again uh, welcome everyone uh, into this session organized by OpenAir uh, about uh, the, the open data and how uh, this openness and not just open data, but the openness is driving uh, policy decision making and especially in, in the uh, climate change, fighting climate change. Before we start, let me go over some housekeeping rules. So the event will be recorded. Uh, we would like uh, to have your, um, um, to, you, for you to mute your microphones. Then if you want to participate, please uh, use chat to introduce yourself and to interact with, with the rest of the people and raise hand to speak because what we want to do is to have a live discussion. Uh, the presentation and the recording will be updated in the event page. And then if you want to, um, to, um, to uh, tweet, feel free or use social media with, uh, with these um, with these, uh, uh, with these uh, hashtags. Uh, having said that, I would like to just say, you know, uh, a few words about what is uh, Open Access and Open, Open Access Week and Open for Climate Justice. If, you, um, if we um, term the climate justice is a, is a concept that addresses the just vision, fair sharing and equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens of climate change and responsibilities to deal with the climate change. So this is something that affects us all. This is something that we all need to participate. And um, as part of this, um, uh, Open uh, Spark, uh, which is an international non-profit organization based in the US, uh, is is uh, is and is uh, is organizing the Open Access Week every year. This year theme, uh, it's about open for climate justice, which is um, again something that we need to uh, we need to take into account, and especially to see how the open science uh, 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 groups, how the open science community can turn open open science and we can put it into the utility of, of, of climate change. How can we join forces uh, to fight climate change? Um, let me see. So uh, this session has invited expert speakers and researchers to discuss how they address this topic. And then uh, what we want to do is, uh, uh, is this session is about pre pre uh, presenting two key projects from the European Commission Horizon 2020, both in support of decision-making. One is the Decido, which is, um, uh, which is a, a, a project that is, is, uh, is uh, getting evidence in cloud for more informed and effective policies. And they will explain what they do uh, in overall, but they will also uh, present us with a particular use case which is about food waste and how food waste affects the climate and the end and the climate change. Uh, we, we will probably hear of more uh, detailed information. And then Intelcom, which is uh, another uh, project which is using data and open data and big data as the CEDO in order to um, uh, make better informed decisions and close the loop from science and research to innovation and to policy decision making. So how can we close the loop? And they will focus on a, on a, on a, on a, on a case study uh, for energy. So how, how, how is this linked together? Uh, going, uh, going and going forward, these are our speakers, Cecilia, uh, uh, let me let me try to do something. Cecilia Cabello, Fabio Perosini, Antonio Filograna, Davide Prete, and uh, Professor Phoebe Kunduri, unfortunately, could not be with us today. But on her behalf, it's uh, it's uh, uh, Lydia Papadaki uh, that I will introduce um, shortly. So uh, we will start. The idea is that we start with uh, with the presentations from the two projects. We will first have the CIDO project um, presenting what they're doing in the particular case of the of the of the food waste and how it affects climate change and how they use openness in, 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 in trying to tackle this problem, and then Intelcom. 
So from, uh, from um, the TIDO, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Antonio Filograna, who is a project coordinator of the TIDO. He's from engineering in Italy, it's a company in Italy. Oops, there is some noise uh, on the background. Somebody has unmuted, okay, thank you. Uh, and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's an ICT specialist, uh, special skills in areas like open and government, social innovation, smart city. Then we have Dave Davide or David uh, Pret, uh, who is the head of the European Projects Office at Volto, and uh, is in charge of a particular uh, case study that they will present in the municipality of Turin. And Fabio Perosini, who is the communication manager of the CIDO, and he is working in Malta. So the floor is yours. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, if I can switch back to the, to the sharing of the screen. Uh, and then uh, please, uh, you have 15 to 20 minutes to present uh, the, 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 the project and how you're tackling uh, the, the several issue. Can you see my screen? Yes, all good. Yes, yes. Okay. So thanks a lot for inviting us uh, to uh, show how the CIDO can impact on the open science and uh, climate justice. Just to give you a very brief background on uh, where the CIDO want to be, want to be, want to work and have an impact is the policy making, and uh, we considering uh, this uh, policy making as a process in order to create a monitor monitoring policies to solve uh, societal challenges. And we image uh, the policy making as a cycle with uh, several uh, phase and uh, activities to be performed in order to create uh, or improve a policy. And uh, the CEDO, the scope of the policy is to support policy makers, but also citizen organization businesses and all the actors involved in the policy life cycle to create better policies or improve the existing one exploiting the power of data the main result of the CIDO, the main output will be a, a web portal uh, on one end and a methodology on the other end in order to uh, provide digital services to facilitate the co-creation activities in each phase of uh, the policy life cycle. So uh, from the scientific point of view, uh, the mission is to be a bring between the public sector on one side, the citizen science world, and the European cloud infrastructures. With the a strong collaboration with EOSC uh, from uh, which we, uh, we will exploit the storage capacity and the processing uh, power. But uh, the CIDO wants to go from data to decision making and in particular from evidence based data to decision making in which way uh, during the project, the lifetime of the project, we are at, uh, at, uh, in the middle of the development of the project and the project last three years. Uh, we uh, wrote a storytelling with other pilot and uh, collecting the needs and challenge of each pilot in uh, the domain of disaster risk management. Uh, we understand what kind of services we can exploit uh, from uh, EOSC and uh, uh, um, starting from all the services provided by EOSC, and we define a, a data catalog, a digital data catalog uh, made by all the open data collected by uh, pilot, but also, and this is an important uh, result, data from coming from the co-creation activities. All this data will be uh, collected and uh, we define how to use this select data, uh, implementing the algorithm to analyze those data and visualize dashboard in order to take decision. And uh, in this way, we are improving uh, our policy based on evidence fact. And here the cycle restart because we evaluate the policy and at the end of the journey, uh, the, all the actors involved in the policy uh, will give uh, feedback on that. 
we uh, want to experiment uh, our solution and uh, now we are in the in the first experimentation phase in four pilot uh, so with the three different domain in finland uh, we deal with the uh, uh, forest fire as in aragon with the wildfire in uh, halki an island of greece uh, we deal with the uh, power outage and in Turin that is the use case uh, David will present after Fabio uh, speaking uh, the, the, um, we have three uh, mainly three use cases one uh, related to the flutes in Turin one to the welcome of Ukrainian refugees and one to avoid to waste uh, food we call so as I already said we are building uh, our data catalog from different uh, data sources. So, uh, so data coming from municipality, data coming from EOSC, of course, uh, GIS data, and also satellite data from Copernicus and Corin program with different, uh, in different domains, for example, food areas, but also energy consumption. We need from EOSC the climate and earthquake data and so on. And these, all this data at the end of the project we are collecting, and also the data, in particular, the data coming from municipality that are now not public data or open, we will release as public data through our Decito data catalog. And this is the, 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 the services that uh, we are going to use in our uh, first version of the Decido portal uh, coming from EOSC. And uh, uh, we will use the, the cloud infrastructure, the data hub as our uh, level of persistency, the checking for the authorization and uh, authentication services and Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Notebook to uh, develop, uh, implement our algorithm. And uh, from OpenAir, we are using Zenodo for, public, for publishing all our uh, documents uh, and make it public and Amnesia uh, in order to uh, pseudo anonymize our data uh, before publishing them. I'm, and now I pass the floor to uh, Fabio that uh, yes. tell us uh, uh, more about the climate justice and how the uh, CEDO can address this uh, important uh, uh, factor. Okay, simply uh, to introduce the, the concept of climate justice and mainly to understand what is uh, the link between climate justice mm -hmm and uh, the Decido the, the project. I think uh, uh, here you have uh, the, the, the official uh, definition of climate justice, but we can summarize that we have uh, three uh, direction. The first one is uh, use data coming from uh, climate change to uh, behave in a better way. Better way uh, addressing uh, the responsibility that we are going to pass to next generation and on the other hand uh, uh, create uh, a political um, direction that uh, will uh, help uh, with regulation uh, and constrain uh, to uh, mitigate uh, uh, climate change for the future next please Okay, uh, here you can see uh, a, a graph showing uh, the, the difference between uh, the uh, traditional concept of extractive economy, the one we are following today, toward a regenerative economy, following this just transition pathway. This is uh, one of the key points uh, of, uh, of the climate justice. And uh, it is uh, very important to understand that uh, also a new approach in terms of data could help a lot uh, in doing that. Next, uh, uh, please, Antonio. Because uh, first of all, uh, we have, uh, and this is exactly what we are going to do in uh, uh, the Shido, we are using data to boost horizontal subsidiarity. 
against uh, the only vertical subsidiarity pathway used uh, in, uh, in the tradition. Next, boosting the co-creation. So involving citizens and asking them data, not providing data uh, uh, in a top-down uh, architecture. Next. Introduce uh, and uh, uh, let's say grow the community attitude uh, in order uh, toward uh, the problem and issue solution, uh, for instance, those related to climate change. It's so easy to say, uh, I'm not able to do ver something very significant significative for climate change. But if we are addressing this issue at community level, it's easier to do something that could affect uh, uh, climate change. Next one. In particular, in uh, the Shido, in this uh, framework, uh, we concentrated on the facilitate the use of expiring food through a distribution and through the right communication to citizens in relation uh, to the real expiring date of the food uh, against uh, the uh, commercial expiring date. That is something uh, very important. Last but not least, is uh, to activate uh, a sort of deliberative process. So propose to um, our representative some uh, proposal that are feasible and tested on field. So uh, it is easier for them to uh, insert them in the process, uh, in the process for uh, for, um, let's say, to, to have them in place. Next. As you can see, we are addressing at least four of the sustainability goals that are part of the UN uh, principles related to climate justice. The first one is the number two, so zero hunger. The 11 sustainable city and communities, the 12 responsible consumption and production, and the 16 peace, justice, and strong institution. This is because at the end, what we understood doing the CIDO is that the level of struggling is going down. And we have really a reduced level of struggling between the citizen and institution acting in this way. Please, Davide, the floor is yours. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. We can see. Uh, well, actually, uh, we, um, uh, we have three scenarios in Torino, uh, and uh, one of these scenarios is the welcoming of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and uh, we started uh, in April of this year uh, about uh, the provision of data regarding difficulties of the Ukrainian refugees uh, coming to Turin. Uh, so we, gather, we gathered all this data uh, in the data catalog, as was mentioned before Antonio. Uh, and we, of course, uh, invited many representatives uh, of all these institutions, uh, civil protection, uh, um, Piedmont region, uh, psychologist organization, uh, representative of Ukrainian community, uh, uh, Ukrainian cultural mediators, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. Of course, also volunteers of association taking care of reception of migrants. Uh, then uh, we prepared uh, the scenario uh, which is, uh, of course, how to guarantee the possible, um, the, the best possible uh, welcoming of Ukrainian citizens. Uh, and then uh, we started in May to define the challenge, uh, create a new tool to provide useful information for Ukrainian refugees, because we saw that uh, the lack of information for refugees coming to Torino uh, in order to receive uh, important services uh, is one of the most uh, big problems that these uh, uh, asylum seekers have uh, uh, to face when they arrive. 
So then we started the policy implementation uh, in September, and this will continue until January uh, of next year. Um, we have decided to create a website containing useful information that are regularly updated by Ukrainian volunteers in their mother tongue. Uh, and uh, in, in, of course, in the end, uh, 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 in the end of the first phase of the uh, pilot, so or at the experimentation field or on the field. We will uh, take um, uh, carry out an analysis of effectiveness of this solution and evaluate, of course, feedback from people using that website. In this uh, way, we will see if uh, we have uh, made a good job. Uh, next, please. So uh, these these are uh, some data uh, we have uh, collected for the scenario of welcoming of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, as you can see, there are some uh, data coming uh, from uh, the uh, reception and integration system of the Italian Ministry of Interior, uh, but also the Office for uh, Foreign Minors of the city of Turin, uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, data from the prefecture of Turin about uh, uh, the presence of asylum seekers uh, uh, in Piedmont. Uh, next, please. Then also, of course, uh, uh, data coming uh, from the Italian National Institutes of Statistics uh, from the metropolitan city of Turin uh, and from the Piedmont region, uh, which is in the forefront uh, uh, when uh, uh, welcoming uh, these migrants. Uh, in fact, there is an extraordinary plan for the reception of uh, uh, population fleeing from war uh, dated uh, April 2022. Uh, and uh, so all these data that, let me say, are official data coming from uh, uh, institution uh, organizations, uh, we have handed uh, one degree thesis uh, from Holger Kurs, uh, uh, who is uh, a cultural Ukrainian cultural mediator living uh, uh, since many years here in Torino. Uh, and uh, she made a thesis uh, uh, many years ago, actually, so uh, in 2012, uh, about uh, social and cultural aspects uh, in the evolution and integration of uh, Ukrainian immigration. But this uh, created, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the background to, uh, to, for our uh, co-creation session. Uh, so uh, okay. So here are some here are some examples of the collected data in the documents we uh, have presented before. So uh, the Ukrainian population in the province of Turin uh, in 2018 uh, was uh, of uh, uh, 1,827 people. So it was the 13th largest foreign community in the province of Turin. And about more recent data, so after uh, the uh, breakdown of the war in Ukraine, um, we have uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, um, Ukrainian citizens coming to you in general, 5.3 million people in Italy, about uh, 1,000, uh, 100,000 people. Uh, in Piedmont, uh, about uh, um, 10,000 people. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the area uh, in, we, in the area of reference uh, of the CEDO project, about 2,000 um, uh, two, 2, people. Uh, so um, um, next uh, slide, please. OK, so uh, in uh, data collection, uh, so all the data we have collected and uh, I showed before uh, were really important in order to learn about the past situation of Ukrainian migrants in Piedmont. And this helped us a lot to facilitate the co-creation process because there was a basis uh, from which to start. Uh, and uh, um, so um, during the co-creation session emerged the, the discrepancy between data provided by the authorities and the real numbers of Ukrainians uh, who arrived in Piedmont and in Turin in particular, according to the local Ukrainian community. Um, so 
um, many many Ukrainians uh, are coming to uh, Turin and are not registering uh, uh, at the prefecture uh, because they have already family receiving them. Uh, so uh, we don't know exactly how many Ukrainians we have on our territory. And this is a problem that was highlighted thanks to the hackathon. Without our hackathon, without our cooperation session, uh, it, uh, it was impossible to, to understand this problem. Uh, another problem uh, was related to the uh, intellectual disability of some Ukrainian children. Um, the, this was highlighted by an organization, uh, a voluntary association, and this problem was not known by the municipality. The municipality was thinking that the problem was uh, that of uh, foreign minors, an accompanied foreign minors, but uh, they, uh, they are very few. So the, the bigger problem is uh, the, the problem of these uh, uh, children with uh, intellectual disabilities that had to interrupt their care uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. And now, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, lost uh, uh, all all the um, all the care they uh, they were they were uh, doing uh, in their home country. Uh, anyway, thanks uh, to the uh, cooperation session, so uh, authorities take note uh, can can took note of this uh, discrepancy and of this uh, problem. Um, but of course, a peer review of the data is always needed. Uh, in order um, to certify the data reported by civil brains. Um, so there is the need uh, of uh, uh, in, an improved uh, communication. Uh, and since this problem, we decided to create uh, an information portal in Ukrainian language. So last uh, slide. OK, so we, we leave you with this uh, question that can be probably uh, a part of the debate that will develop uh, later on. Uh, we, we had a methodological doubt. Uh, so uh, who can certify the new data set uh, created by the intersection of data provided by the authorities with evidence-based data? So uh, we have some data coming from the authorities. We have seen that uh, they are not always in line with uh, uh, data coming from citizens. Uh, in this case, about the number of Ukrainians, uh, but who can certify that these uh, data coming from citizens uh, are, uh, um, are right? So this is our methodological problem, and we leave you with this open question for, for everybody. Thank you so much for your attention. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. I think, you know, I have um, nailed some questions, and I will uh, get back to you after uh, Intel presents. Uh, so, so the idea here is that what, what I gathered from your, from your presentation is that you rely heavily on co-creation, which is part of the citizen, you know, citizen involvement in decision making. Uh, and uh, think about, you know, the question is, you know, if you can tell us after uh, Intelcom, how and if you're using the same kind of um, of, uh, of, uh, of methodology used in the in the other cases which are more related to the climate change like uh, the food waste and the fires and, and stuff uh, so this is a question for you to think of while i introduce uh, cecilia i introduce um now uh, uh intel comp so let me start by introducing the coordinator of Intelcom, which is uh, Cecilia Cabello. And Cecilia is the Director of Operations in the Spanish Foundations for Science and Technology, FETHIT, which is uh, an institution dependent on the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. Uh, Cecilia has been uh, an open air partner for a long time in her group. Uh, and the idea is that uh, what she will present is, is, um, is, 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 a, is a methodology where Intelcom is based on big data and AI in order to get this evidence and make the connection. 
Cecilia, before, be, before I give the floor to you, let me introduce also uh, Livia Papadaki. Livia Papadaki is a PhD candidate at the Athens University of Economics and Business. So she has a business and economics background, and this is uh, in policy making. This is uh, one of the um, in evidence policy making, I would say this is one of the very you know uh, hot um, uh, areas to be in. She's also the co-manager of EIT Climate Kick uh, Hub in Greece and a researcher at the Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation on IFORIA, which is um, more on sustainability. So this is where I think um, I think it was Fabio when when or the, um, I do Davide. Uh, I think when he was talking about this regenerative economy, which uh, Davide, uh, you know, uh, my question is, is, is it the same as the circular economy, for example? So I will give the floor now to, um, uh, to Intelcom, Cecilia and Intelcom, so that they can explain what they're doing, the methodologies that they're using, the connection to the climate change, and we can come back to, to, the, to the discussion. Cecilia. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. We good. can hear you, we can see you, we can see everything fine. Okay, okay, good. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Natalia, for this presentation. Um, yeah, I'm going to present uh, briefly. I'm going to I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, and before we get into the the the, the subject of, of, of this, of the climate justice and data, um, I want to talk a little bit, um, one step back and about uh, evidence based policymaking. Let's see if I'm capable of advancing the slide. Is it moved? No. Is the slide moving? No, it's not moving, is it? No. Okay, let's see if I do it this way. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so first of all, what, what do we mean by evidence-based policies? What are we talking about when we want to talk about evidence-based policies? Uh, what we really want to talk, what we're talking about in general is, is strategic intelligence to improve the formulation, the delivery, and the evaluation of STI policy interventions. So evidence is one of the key foundations for policymaking, especially for science, technology, innovation policies. And evidence is data. Now, policymaking in science, technology, innovation is entering a new era. The STI policymakers need to design and to implement new, a new generation of policies, STI policies, especially because it needs to contribute to sustainable transitions. Now here, the approach is complex because it's not just in the realm of science and technology innovation. We have to also get into the sectoral policies related to this. And in particular to the green transition, obviously we're talking about uh, um, environmental uh, policies. So STI policymakers now demand systemic and transdisciplinary knowledge to be able to make their decisions. So to obtain this knowledge, we are seeing there's a, there's a, there's a reassessment or reevaluation of how evidence is generated and policymakers are supporting this type of new experimentation when it comes to uh, policy making. So the new STI policy uh, stance and context implies new information needs. Policymakers have specific policy questions about the role of science and innovation in the green transition that call for quantitative evidence. So specific evidence, specific information, and specific knowledge is what they want, is what they're demanding for. So, um, the STI policymakers need to know different things. For example, the scientific and technological landscape related to climate change. For instance, the patenting trends in renewable energies, for example. The impacts of STI policies on green transition outcomes for uh, are of interest also. So for example, we, they need to know a little bit more about uh, what's happening in net zero carbon emissions. And also they need to know the, the social, societal needs related to environment. What are the citizens demanding and what's important to them? The quantitative evidence to answer these questions include the domain specific measurements and indicators and interface of STI and the environment. So we're talking about open data, data that's available that has to do with STI, but it has to do also with the environment and new sources of data to feed into these, uh, to these indicators. 
So when I talk about new sources of data, it's before maybe policymakers work with statistics or specific type of data, but now there's much more information out there. So what, do we, what are we talking about? We're talking about digital tools for STI policy evidence. So at the same time that the policymakers asking for all this information, digitalization provides new opportunities for strategic intelligence to support, to support STI policies. The evolving context of STI policies calling for new data sources and tools to support evidence-based policies. So we're talking about new sources like administrative data, websites, social media data, and all the information generated by the, the science and technology community, and new tools to collect, to analyze, and to visualize this data. So this is the background and the context in, in what has drove Intercom to be a project and to be created. So what is Intercom? What is this project? It's a European project to build a digital platform that exploits large volume of data in science, technology, and innovation activities with text analytics. Who can benefit from this platform? The platform is mainly aimed at STI policymakers, a platform based on text analysis that will assist policymakers and research funders in specific tasks or workflows at different stages of the policy cycle. So again, like I said, we're talking about large amounts of information, we're talking about evidence-based policy making, we're talking about a whole approach. And so this is what um, we want to try to support uh, different policy, the STI policymakers in the decision making. So for example, in agenda setting or setting priorities, when discussing the context and the landscape of policy intervention, with Intercom, we can get a granular information on scientific and technology trends and results. In the evaluation of proposals for funding, that's another way that Intercom can help. Agencies like Vinova, for example, in Sweden, um, the Swedish Innovation Agency are already using text analysis to assist evaluated, evaluators in the proposal. In Spain, in the Secretary of State for uh, Artificial Intelligence, they have some experience with Corpus Viral, which is a previous um, project that, that uh, was launched. And it, it's one of the main pillars also of Intercom, and it, they analyze large volumes of, uh, they analyze the different proposals to be able to evaluate. And obviously monitoring the results of funded project, Intercom can also be used. So this platform, Intercom is one of them, and there's other, obviously many other firms can benefit other actors like people from academia, from the science realm, people from industry, or even citizen organizations to get involved in STI policies. Because we know that the whole, uh, another issue that's important with development of science and policies is the co-creation of the STI policies or the engagement of the citizens. So this is really important, especially in the context of environment. So my last slide is that Intercom is an integrated platform that includes innovative services to collect, analyze and visualize, visualize large, large amounts of science, technology, innovation data and information so that it can be uh, used by policymakers. To develop the platform, we use open data. For example, open air has uh, the research graph data, is, that's what we use. And we use other um, information that's, that we uh, feed into our uh, data lake. The platform, what we're doing is testing it in three different domains. So the whole idea is we want to co-create the, the platform itself and we want to co-create the policies. So we are testing the Intercom platform in three different domains, artificial intelligence, cancer, and climate change. And the platform will be using um, living labs to be able to co to be able to co-create these contexts, the policies and the platform itself. So I'm not going to talk about the living lab of, of environment. I'm going to let my colleague uh, Lydia uh, present that part of the living lab. So Lydia, you can go ahead, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you a lot, Cecilia. Let me share my screen. Uh, one second, yeah, there you go. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Yes, Lydia. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for the introduction and this beautiful session. I'm happy to share with you some in uh, some meat for regarding our case study on climate change. So first thing, uh, first things first, as Cecilia just mentioned, um, the Intelcom platform is about to develop three main tools. One is the STI viewer, the second is the STI policy participation portal, and finally the evaluation Wenchbens. Uh, I would like to start with the Intelcom STI viewer and the living labs. As you know, the Intelcom uh, 
uh, seeks to help the decision making of policymakers and administration administrators by turning all this huge amount of dynamic and uh, heterogeneous data in actionable insights and evidence-based policy. And this is where the living labs are expected to play an, an important role in order to co-create uh, these needs and, um, uh, and make this platform as useful as possible for the final users. The STI viewer, uh, a quick revision, uh, will focus on four main areas. It will have the sectors like science, technology, industry, HR, society, to the geography, geographical aspects, the uh, research area like the domain, category, and topic, and other facets. All these are very important for us in order to uh, identify through the living labs what is most uh, what is needed. Here you can see a quick uh, overview of how the different work packages work together. Uh, you can see that the living lab workshops are working very closely with the policy questions, which then are interacting with the work packets two and three, which are about the data sets and the user stories. In order at the end to have not at the end, in order to have the living labs uh, feeding back the user stories with all this visualization and the needs of the stakeholders. Uh, here we go in the key elements of the uh, and principles of the living labs. As you can see. The living labs are the described, defined by three main uh, uh, categories. One is the key elements, the second is about the principles, and then we have also the policy ecosystem. When it comes to the elements, it's living lab, it's, uh, it's, uh, it sets its own individual goals and tries to realize them throughout uh, its lifetime. So the planning and implementation of the key elements need to be uh, are tailored uh, specifically by each living lab. The Nice Living Lab uh, will set its own uh, policy questions, uh, where during the Living Lab preparation and planning phase, uh, we will collect uh, 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 we will collect and triangle to uh, the, the policy framework from uh, in uh, collaboration with the work package one. Then during the Living Lab implementation, this initial set of policy questions will be expanded and refined depending on the needs and the interests of the engaged stakeholders. Uh, the next stage is about the co-development, where depending on these policy questions and um, indicators, uh, we will identify which um, which are the, which are the the which are the data that uh, should be used, proceed, and presented via these user tools. The stakeholder dimension that is uh, mentioned here in the comprises three main elements. First, it includes the mapping of these potential stakeholders stakeholders, second, the recruitment of the participants, and finally, the ongoing stakeholder engagement, will, will, um, gener which will generate these ambition goals and keep the stakeholders emotionally linked to the living lab. Then we have the co-creation or co-development process, which is closely tied to the technical development of the Intelcom platform tools and services in order to um, to, uh, which is why the timeline in the platform uh, in the platform development part, part is um, it's visually represented in the roadmap of the of each living lab, and then we have the living lab roadmap, which is a visual representation of the major events planned for the lab's implementation. This shows these uh, living labs are also connected with the development process, and its roadmap is then tailored to the living lab in terms of number, timing, scope of the event, etc. Then uh, the next question is why climate change, which is one of our case study. Climate change, as you know, is one of the biggest challenges that we're supposed to, with, that we're facing uh, uh, today. And uh, here is a quick breakdown of the of the climate change uh, challenge uh, based on the greenhouse gas emissions as it is defined in the IPCC report, uh, report. As you can see, the energy emits the most, and this is why the, yeah, it became a priority for the Intelcom project. Um, to start working on the energy sector of the climate change. Also, the preparatory living labs that uh, occurred in, uh, in the, from the beginning until the middle of, uh, uh, from the middle of 2021 until the beginning of 2022 identified also the energy as a key priority. Uh, when we talk about uh, how we will work in the living labs, we try to aspect beyond the science and technology and innovation aspect, also the sustainable components that are related to the climate change, and these are the economy, the environment, and the society. Uh, when it comes to the purpose, first, 
uh, we talk about the context research. So this is where the participants investigate the context and the focus areas of where they where we will focus our, um, our discussion. Then we have the discovery stage where each participant is asked to provide insights into the expected SDI uh, policy questions and the new service opportunities that can be provided by the Intelcom platform. Then comes the co-creation stage where the final users of the Intelcom platform are involved into co-creators and um, together they come to to provide uh, suggestions on uh, how the tool can be more uh, most useful. Then we have the evaluation stage where the users evaluate and validate all these new solutions and services provided by the technical team of the Intelcom platform. And last, we have the final users experience the technical testing in a semi-realistic context of use where they can uh, provide again feedback. Uh, when it comes to the expected results and outcomes, first we have that uh, we want to inform all these future platform users, uh, which are the stakeholders who will participate in the Living Labs about the pro about the Intelcom project and how they can get evo uh, involved in the development of the platform. Second, we want to validate the functionalities of the tools uh, by these stakeholders. Uh, third, we want to provide um, exper an experimentation space where all the selected stakeholders will feel, feel free uh, to think about the limitations and the extensions of the platform in order to be useful in their daily life. And finally, we want to meet the stakeholders' expectations with regard to the update of the system. Uh, in regards to the stakeholders and where they're coming from, they're coming mainly from the policy sector, but also from the academia and uh, the public and, uh, administration, as well as from the business and the NGOs. Here you can see a quick overview of the climate change um, uh, living labs that are coming uh, that, that have have been um, uh, delivered so far and are coming in the next couple of months. First, we had the preparatory stage where um, in this stage we discussed uh, overall the challenge of climate change and what are the what the, what could be the main priorities for the stakeholders. And based on this, we identified the energy as being the most important one. And then we have focused workshops on the specific on the specific tools of the uh, of the Intelcom platform. First, we start with the STI viewer, and then we will go through the participation portal um, and the evaluation workbench. So what we want to achieve through all these workshops, which are as you can see, they have a different target. Some of them are. Uh, with academia and industry, while others are with public administrations as citizens, we want to take the different perspectives for these tools and to go to to uh, do deeper discussions in regard to the needs of these uh, of these specific stakeholders in these sectors. Finally, at the close to the end of the project in uh, the June of 2023 should be there, uh, and maybe. Uh, 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 after, um, actually, after the June of 2023, we expect to have a big event where we will invite all the co-designers and the interested parties to see uh, the final product of Intelcom and uh, and learn and uh, have a discussion with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Livia. So, 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 in my understanding, is that the living labs in Intelcom are you know are starting or you know or do you have any results because we understand that from the living labs you will include many stakeholders and ask them questions about you know the various decision making uh, policy questions and the data what, what, what is the what is the you know what is the scope of the living labs oh thank you so because much was... Alia, for the question so first, we have implemented so far the preliminary, the preparatory living labs, which finished last uh, February. And from these preparatory living labs, we got useful data sets about the, where to look on uh, the initial stage of the development of the platform. Um, and we also identified our main focus on climate change because climate change is a very wide uh, topic. And uh, I wish we could, we could uh, hand, uh, target all of its aspects at once, but this is not possible. So we had to prioritize. So these are the two main uh, outcomes of the first round of uh, preparatory living labs. 
Now, the second round, as I said, this is uh, in uh, hand in hand with the um, uh, development of the platform, which means that we um, we need, uh, that we need to give each other um, uh, input in order to to proceed to 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 co-create um, this tool, okay. which means that there, the official living labs uh, on climate change start in December. So in one month and a half, more or less, and we're very excited to it and to see how all this has come together. Okay. So what I want to keep, what I want to keep from Intelcom, because you know this was uh, this was uh, you know for the outsiders, it, it may not have been uh, easy to understand, is that you will be using uh, big data, open data, AI driven, and then you will have the methodology of the living labs in order to uh, include and involve and engage with the stakeholders uh, of different types. This is what I'm holding. Okay. Now. Now, okay, so now what, what I would like to do, and uh, maybe I will have the chat open for questions, but what I would like, you know, if the people can put their, their, their cameras on, is to have a discussion, you know, a real discussion, not a presentation of projects like what we've seen, but, you know, open science and climate change. And open science is a lot of, it's not just about open data. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's a lot more than open data and an accessing open data. It's about open methodologies, as I said in the beginning. It's about involving um, uh, uh, people or you know stakeholders from 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 various places from the beginning in the process of of making uh, of making science or on how science can be used in order to um, uh, to, 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 be, to support decision makings like uh, both of the projects will do. So before I ask, I have three questions, but before I ask the questions, I would like to go back to the Decido project and ask about you know, how the circular economy that you mentioned in the beginning is linked to the food waste use case because you presented the Ukrainian use case, which is, 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 an, is an excellent use case to, to show for us the open science part. So how you retrieve the data, what is the methodological aspect of the data, and what are the transparency and trust issues in the data? And I will have, uh, come to this question uh, in, in shortly. But because we focus now on open science and, uh, and climate change, could you say like, you know, half a minute or a minute, something about the circular economy and how it's linked to this food waste use case? Because if I may, I read from the web, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, on the web, the following, you know, I, I will read it and it says, the connection between food loss and waste and climate change is increasingly recognized as important. And so is the link between climate change and agricultural supply chains and resiliency. And just in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency has estimated that each year in the US alone, food loss and waste embodies 170 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in uh, gas uh, emissions. So those, you know, those are staggering numbers. And so, you know, this is this is what this is what you know how the circular economy and climate change and you know open data, if you want, is is just linked together. So maybe you you would like to say just you know a couple of things on this uh, on this uh, use case that you have. Yeah. Yes. Uh, absolutely. So uh, in uh, Torino, uh, we started from the emergency of COVID nineteen. Uh, and uh, many families uh, uh, fell in poverty and they uh, didn't have uh, uh, what to eat. So the number of families uh, that uh, uh, fell in poverty and requested uh, uh, food from uh, uh, authorities uh, was uh, really, in really increased uh, in 2020 and then also uh, in uh, 2021. Uh, so we um, we contacted one uh, member of a widespread network here in Torino that was collecting food uh, to distribute uh, food uh, to families in difficulties in hardship. Uh, and uh, they had this problem that uh, when uh, they collected uh, uh, products uh, with uh, the labels uh, um, uh, expiration date, uh, uh, 
to be consumed uh, preferably uh, within uh, a, a certain date, uh, families tend uh, not to uh, accept these products because they consider uh, very uh, harmful for their uh, health. Uh, so, um, uh, in, in this case, there was a waste of, uh, was generated a waste of food, a big waste of food because uh, families' ill difficulties uh, didn't know uh, about uh, how, um, uh, about these products. They, they don't trust to, uh, to consume these products. Uh, and so the problem was how uh, to, um, to let these families accept these products. Uh, and we, um, we decided to introduce uh, uh, levels that not only show the best before expiration date, but also the time frame on which products can still be consumed after the best before expiration date has passed. Uh, so uh, there are some not fresh products, of course, but uh, some kind of products can still be consumed after this best before expiration date. And so we decided to introduce labels uh, saying uh, saying this. So the um, the time frame on which you can still consume products. In this case, uh, you avoid a big waste uh, of food. Uh, and uh, uh, now we are trying to implement in this policy through a printer. We have already bought a printer. Uh, and now with the collaboration of local associations, we are experimenting this, uh, uh, this new way uh, for, for product packaging. Yeah. Okay, so I gather, so, so, so now you're in this effort. So I gather at some point you will be able to gather data. Okay, and you know, see, see how this uh, this uh, takes forward you know for uh for uh, for next uh, for next uh, or for others to make decisions so now that we come to data is you know um, in the beginning i think it was you uh, uh david that you said that this is you know the power of the data and then somebody else you know is uh, is uh, said about the methodology of the data so what I would like to ask both, you know, maybe starting from Cecilia <coughs> and Lydia now, is how easy it is to find data that you need? You know, I know about the Open AI Research Co-op, as you said. <coughs> I know about the European Patent Office data that they make it open and we use in Intelcom. But how easy it is to find other data that, you know, we want to use? And not just only how easy it is, what is the quality of the data? And where do you think open science and NEOS you know, in intervening in this, you know, in order to say, how can we find research data that is open and also how to find public sector information data that is, is open and how to combine. So, so what, is, what are all the issues that we find and you know, where we could intervene? Okay, um, before Lydia intervenes, maybe she can, I can, in general, what I think is that um, you, you, you're fully aware that science and technology innovation produce a lot of data, and some of it is open and some of it is not open. I think um, there's been a transition with respect to the data and how it, uh, it's available or not or open or not. Um, with this, with the pandemic, obviously things have changed. Things have. Uh, there was a, there was definitely a need to, to to use data, scientific data, to develop develop um, uh, advancement. And I think with the with the green transition, this is happening too. We need we need the information. So where to find the data? That there's a whole process to that. Um, I think uh, the closed data, obviously, uh, there's a there's a question, especially for public administration, for like projects. That data in in some cases is closed and in some cases open. Horizon Europe obviously is open, um, and the, the European Commission funded data is open. NSF is open. NIH is open. Other others are not. Others are not. So I think there's a, there's a tendency that that data is be there, and I think that that these type of um, it's a win win situation where. I think the sharing of the, the sharing of the data and information uh, improves science, and the sharing of the data and information is useful for for policymakers. Now, the quality of the data, I, I I understand, I fully understand that there's an issue with the quality of data, but it's what it is. So, um, how, how can I say this? The quality of a, the statistics, we can also say, okay, how good is it? Well, the statistics agency certify the data, but in the end, it's a survey. It's a survey that they. They take out to the citizens or they take out to the businesses or take out to research. The data is collected in a different manner. So, so I wouldn't 
not not to worry too much about the data, but it is what it is. And I think that we knowing that the data has the quality it has, it's a proxy for information. It, it's it's a way to it's an input. I'm not I don't think that it's a one-to-one -one situation where we have this data that shows this, so we make this decision. I think it's an input. So this is my general uh, okay. <laughs> intervention about data, I, I think. Maybe Lydia can talk okay. more about environmental data and what we're using in this or what we found with the preliminary Libby labs, which were very useful. Lydia? Uh, thank you a lot, Cecilia. And basically, what you highlighted that the uh, data you are used as a proxy, this is a very uh, good takeaway on what we do. Uh, coming from the living labs, uh, what um, what we have observed is this: uh, first, is the difficult is the um, is the accessibility of the data, open or closed. Uh, in, in many countries, the data are not even are not available in English, which uh, makes them okay. uh, the, the challenge even greater because you need someone to speak the local language in order to translate, which is not always easy when we consider the, the number of countries in the world. And the second is, as you can, as you always said, the, the quality and so the trust on the data, which creates uh, some challenges on the stakeholder uh, management who are not believing what they see as trends and tendencies uh, as they don't have trust in um, uh, in the data. This is something we saw also uh, quite uh, strongly in uh, the preparatory living labs where we engage stakeholders also beyond Greece from the from uh, the Balkan uh, from the Balkan and some um, uh, east uh, uh, western east western Asian countries uh, that uh, the trust was even uh, lower to to the, to the quality of the data. Okay, I think this this also I think it was either the video or Antonio who said about this. I think it was the video about the methodological. You had the same or similar problem with with a with a trust in data, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that the problem is uh, the availability, no, and the, the 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 not the availability, but the accessibility to the data, no. Because in a, a, a lot of the national or European data portal, we have a lot of data, but sometimes, and uh, I saw during the Fiverr summit uh, last month uh, that in Spain, for example, there is uh, a situation of the of open data that data set. Uh, uh, the seven percent of data set are unavailable in the national portal no and this is uh, something or uh, for example there is a lack of standardized data model uh, or uh, not open license so we have open data but not open license uh, and uh, uh, th there is a lack of uh, geolocalization for example and uh, the data uh, are not updated uh, for example, they are updated uh, once per month. And uh, uh, our uh, strategy is to uh, exploit uh, uh, what we call hackathons, uh, that is our co part of our co-creation session. So the hackathon is something technological, not to develop something, uh, a challenge to develop something. Our hackathon uh, is uh, a challenge to think all together to find the solution to create a better policy, focusing each hackathon in a micro needs. Uh, what mean? What does it mean? Uh, it means that. Uh, during our hackathon, we uh, are around the table with uh, the actors of the, uh, the uh, that uh, specific phase of policy life cycle, and we discuss with them what are the uh, the action we need to to undertake in order to uh, to to address the problem we are discussing during this phase. And this means that we are creating. Uh, after a review of the literature on the methodology, we are creating an open methodology within the uh, the Decido project, uh, an open uh, co-creation methodology that allow us to uh, collect needs, but also during uh, the co-creation activity, collect data and understand what kind of data we need to meet our goal. To 
to create evidence-based policy. And uh, during these uh, two months of our activities uh, in, the in the first experimentation phase, we uh, uh, we talking about data coming from citizen for the, the example of the Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, and uh, data uh, coming from the uh, municipalities. Because, for example, in Turin, there is a civil servant that are very uh, skilled in the open data that they can exploit. And we are looking for also on extra data coming from EOSC, for example. And uh, okay. uh, this is our strategy to collect data. But as uh, David said at the end of our presentation, uh, from data collected by the, the uh, crowd, let me say, uh, we need to certify this new data and uh, we have this problem. And maybe uh, we need, in general, a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, no, a, a peer review of, uh, of these new data in order to make them open and accessible. I think Celia, Cecilia wants to say something. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. Thank you. I, want to, I want to react to that. I think that's a very important point that you, that you bring up. Um, the, the whole idea is that this data that we're using is not collected for this purpose, okay? So normally when you, like the statistical agencies, they have, they collect the data for a purpose that's to feed into policy, obviously, because they want to provide information. And all this data that we're using is collected for different purposes. And so it's 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 hard to, 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 to build on that. So besides pressuring evidence-based policymaking, I think the new thing that we're, to, at least it's, uh, being talked about in an international context at, at the OECD level is policies for data, which means we need to talk about the quality, mm -hmm. the trust, the accessibility, the periodicity, the the, valid, the, um, the if it's valid or not the data, if it's interoperable, standards and norms. So we need policies for the data so that the data can be used in better way for policy making. So it's a circle. It's not just yeah. Let's evidence-based policy making is, is good and it's important. But sometimes we, we might need to think about the policies needed so when it, that when data is collected, even though it's not for that purpose, it's for de de different purposes. So this is food for thought and think something that we have that's beyond the realm of us, but, but I think it's important. I think you brought up some good points there, Antonio. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cecilia. We need to create uh, a, a new policy for data <laughs> so <laughs> we can I exploit our projects for that. Yes. I think I think I think you know it's uh, at least at the European Commission level at the at the at the at the, at the, at the uh, member state level. I think they are kind of creating these policies on PSI. So, for example, you know uh, you mentioned the geotagging um, problem. Uh, inspired directive, you know, uh, they 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 aspire to do that in all in all the public sector, right? Uh, the, the thing is, the thing is that I think, you know, it's, it's policy on data, but also it's infrastructure for data, okay? Because, you know, it's, it's also, we know the research infrastructures on, on the domain of research, they are building them, but in the, in, in the government section or in the public section, I think, you know, they, they are building it, but not as, um, let's say, as aligned as we're doing in EOSC. And I think, you know, um, uh, initiatives such as EOSC is, 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 are really great because they're bringing this alignment. But I, I, I want to keep that, I want to keep two things, is that at one point, what Cecilia said is that, uh, I think I want to keep two points from Cecilia. One is, you know, that what you said is, you know, data, it is what it is, okay? So we need to, to, to use it, especially when you talk about big data as we, we're doing in Intercom, is we rely, we rely on the bigness of the data in order to, um, to remove uh, the, the, the biases and the errors. And, uh, but having said that, we understand that there is you no know, data for policies are, are, are good. And Cecilia, you know, I'm not going to say anything about open air, but what I could say something is about the EPO data. So the European Patent Office data, they have been doing that for years and they're trying to put the, the data into their policies. 
and that we can use. And Eurostat is doing that. So, so I think there is a lot of going on on this data for policies. It's just that, you know, it's the alignment that I'm missing a bit. Okay. Uh, now, uh, second question, because I think, you know, we're over time, but I would like to ask this question and I would like an honest response is, okay, in, in Intelcom, we have the living labs. In um, in uh, the CEDO, the CEDO, you have the the, the co-creation, you know, that you're doing through uh, various uh, mechanisms. One of them could be the you know the the hackathons or others. So this is something that costs money. Okay, so everyone in open science says, okay, let's involve citizens, let's involve all stakeholders in the processes from design to implementation to uptake to continuation. So first of all, this is cost money, and now the European Commission is, is, is paying for projects. How, first of all, how do you see this going on after the, the project ends? Because, you know, one is data, the other is infrastructure, but the other is the people involved. And, and then in reality, how effective has this been? Okay, it, it's good to have, you know, this, this, this engagement of people. But is it engagement, you know, has been effective or has it been, you know, more, um, more work than, uh, you know, than the impact that it brings? You know, this is an honest question from my side, yeah. because I know how much effort this requires and well, how sustainable it is. I can answer from, for, from the Decido point of view yes. and from Thank the you. Turin point of view, because uh, by now the Turin uh, pilot is the most advanced in terms of engagement. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, uh, as you were with, with us, so the, the, the point is we have to find uh, tricks or a uh, solution day by day. So for instance, uh, in the food distribution, what we did is we provided for free to the, the process owner uh, a laptop. A laptop to motivate him to participate and also to give, him, to give her the possibility to participate actively in, in the platform. And uh, uh, we are also providing further support. So for instance, uh, a label printer to print uh, labels, uh, to uh, modify the policy and a, a tablet. Uh, so, well, you have to, to work around that. It is mandatory that you involve volunteers because you have no money, as you said, you can count on very small money, for instance, coming from bank, foundation, or stuff like that in order to continue the project after the end. But to do that, you need from the very beginning to involve a volunteer. In Turin, what we are going to do, we discuss that with Davide, because David is representing an agency, a, an agency that the national level is uh, dealing with volunteering. So it's a second level uh, agency, is an agency uh, coordinating association, but uh, David could say more if we have time. And the idea is to create a dedicated association for uh, policy co-creation. So uh, trying to engage people participating now in the co-creation process to uh, create uh, between them an association, asking money, helping them to ask money for projects dedicated to specific policy improvement and uh, create a sort of pathway that could be sustainable after the end of the project. It could work. It could work because uh, we experimented uh, that mechanism and uh, it could work. But uh, it's an hard work. More than it's more difficult than technologies or data collection. <laughs> this is a yes. experience. Yes, I think I think I think what you have described is true. But you know, you know what I would like to perhaps you know propose on the table 
is uh, the, the, the volunteer, you know, the volunteer and, uh, and the involvement could be smarter in not just to engage and, you know, they have these hackathons, but think about small apps that people can use in order to, uh, you know, to, um, to, to get the data in. So this is this is what some 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 uh, associations you know around health patients around you know these are doing. So we're gathering data with wearables, smart wearables, smart you know smart apps, and this is implicit. So you know you don't have sometimes or many times to have people around the table. Well, On the okay. other hand, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. Well, th there is a, an issue. There is an issue. I got your point. There is an issue. We are facing very sensible categories. So for instance, when we talk about food distribution, we, mm -hmm. we, we thought about having some implicit uh, sensors or stuff like that. But uh, from, from some privacy issue, it was absolutely impossible. So for instance, now we have not the right to talk directly with the person receiving the food but we have to talk with the volunteer who is going to, to distribute the food because it's a very, very sensible because those people, they don't like to be recognized. They don't want to, to, to be shown. And, uh, and for other reason, we, for instance, in the Ukrainian um, situation, we have, uh, lot of uh, children. And so we don't want to have any kind of problem. They ask us, for instance, never to film them in the face. So it, it's not so easy when you go in uh, the social, um, let's say in the social issue to, uh, to address this point. It's very, it's more easy when we talk about the floats the third, the third team that we are uh, addressing in Turin, there with the civil protection is quite easy. But with the Ukrainian and the food distribution, well, it's a challenge. Okay, I see, I see. So Livia, um, what about, what about, you know, the leading lab and the stakeholders, you know, so I understand that you know we are gathering everyone around the table, and we will be gathering as long as uh, Intelcom is running. But what happens afterwards? Yeah, very good point. Uh, this is uh, something that comes to the business plan of the Intelcom platform. And as you say, one more reason we want to engage the right stakeholders and to keep them involved, and through all this cooperation approach, is because these are the future users and possible the future clients, many of them. So this is part of the sustainability platform, uh, plan of the platform. And uh, that's why it's uh, one more reason why it's uh, so important to us. To add to that uh, really quickly, uh, yes, uh, Natalia, please. I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, um, how can I say, accountability. Uh, what we're trying to do in general is, is in the engagement of citizens is, is necessary in policymaking. And it, it's gonna, in the end, it's gonna be more cost efficient for the policymakers because the, the citizens, since they're involved, upstream later on when the policy is in place or uh, or being evaluated there it's less questionable because they were involved in next week so what we're trying to do is change the way things are working so the, the living lab is also the co-creation process that po the policymakers themselves realize that they can use the citizens and use other stakeholders for the, for the design or for their for their policy making issues so it's a matter of a it's a test bed but it's it's just to change the way they they they, they practice. So it's not necessarily um, how we're going to survive with living labs beyond Intercom. What we want to change is a way of thinking of the way of doing. And Intercom, the platform itself has its sustainability, but what we want to also change is the way things, the way STI policies are made, and 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 then it's it's a feeding process that downstream will be more efficient, which we hope. So mm -hmm. so. That's I mean, I, I think I, I, I think you're right, you know, in, in, in general, I, I fully agree with you. It's just that, you know, uh, it's not only about sustainability. Is, is it, you know, as I said before, you know, what is the impact of involving citizens? Because, you know, do we want to involve citizens just to verify decisions that policymakers 
have already taken. You know, this is this is something that usually happens. Uh, second is, you know, at what stage do you involve citizens or you know the the the, the, the experts? Then is what tools are we using in order to involve them in the process? Because again, I think in order for us to be sustainable, we need to be smart. And and second is, you know, who is taking over these, you know, these, you know, this is this is this on the municipality um, 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 level? Is it on the government level? Is it on the European level? This is, you know, and I think, you know, from the CEDO to uh, the CEDO to uh, to Intelcom, we, we face two completely different uh, aspects, but they both involve co-creation, which I consider, you know, as one of the principles of, of openness and open science. So I, I'm not sure if we have any, 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 any responses, but I would be very much interested to see at the end of the projects, you know, how do these communities that we are building during the, 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 the projects, how do we sustain the mechanism, the communities itself? You know, these are the questions for me. And this is uh, you know, also part of the openness. Okay, so I don't see any questions, and I think you know we're over time. I would like to thank everyone in the in, in this in this panel for providing the view and then you know. Uh, in open air now, we will um, uh, we will try to disseminate parts of or the whole uh, webinar or this uh, discussion or coffee uh, coffee section uh, as we as we session as we as we said. Um, I think you know we would like to hear more from you from you from from both projects as we go through and um, and to see where we could you know better work together especially with the CEDA. I know we, we have amnesia I know we have other tools but it would be very much of interest to us to see what the problems of the data the data openness the data quality that you have thank you all so much for attending goodbye thanks a lot for inviting thank you bye bye thanks everyone thank you bye bye, bye. bye. bye.